Hi, I'm Shannon Whiteside, the Program Director of the Alvieri. This is the eighth year of the Alvieri, and we are so excited to give you a preview of some of the books we'll be reading for the 23-24 school year. If you want to learn more about the Alvieri, you can find more information by downloading the viewbook, which is linked in the video description below. The viewbook also contains a free term of picture study lessons with our updated lesson plan format. In this video, I will talk to you about the books that will be part of Form 3, which is 7th and 8th grade. I'm going to begin with architecture. This year, we are reading a new book for architecture called What Adults Don't Know About Architecture. I know the title sounds a little odd, but the authors have an interesting way to introduce principles behind design and how architecture affects people and communities. They keep it very practical and these principles can be applied to one's neighborhood or city. I really hope this book gives students the words and concepts to apply to buildings they see all around them every day. As citizenship, we're using a new book for government for seventh grade called This Is Our Constitution. I really like this book. It's written by a gold star father who was born in Pakistan and later became an American citizen. His love for freedom and his appreciation for the fundamental rights found in America come through in his writing as he guides students to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We're hoping this will be a staple for all seventh graders. Eighth graders will be doing something different and Kelly will be telling you more about that. American government in grade eight is covered by several different resources. We start out with this one right here. It's a great new book that we found. Um, it's called Miles to Go for Freedom. And it really talks about the, the time frame from actually before the 20th century, um, the late 1800s, into the 1900s and on up through um, the 1950s or so especially. This book covers all of the things that are, are happening um, with the civil rights movement during this time. It's a very balanced look um, at, at what's going on in different places and, and the importance of, um, of different speeches and, and civil rights movement um, speeches and, um, and different talks. And it even shows you different pictures along the way as well that were, were important um, as you look through the pictures they provide a lot of good insight to the subject that we're studying. Um, this book stops and this book picks up. So the, the lunch counter sit-ins and some of the peaceful movements that are, that are happening, the protests that are going on um, are covered as well with the photographic history, histories and photo essays. So during this time frame, the 20th century, the photographs and audio, and um, TV become really important. And it becomes part of what, what the people at the time saw and what we see as um, representing um, events and activities. So that's a really important piece. We're gonna be using those in several different areas um, of history this year. I'll show you some more in a few minutes. Um, but as part of the civics or the American government, we're gonna be using that as well as this one. Um, the advent of, of debates on TV uh, you've read about some other debates this last year, and this kind of reaches back and helps you remember what you've talked about with the Lincoln-Douglas debates and moving forward into the Kennedy-Nixon debates, which are a very different picture and story, have huge impact on our um, on civics and the politics of the time. And um, and so you'll be reading through this and seeing many, it, you can read through it, but it also gives you uh, many other pictures. And there'll be some other resources that will allow you to go and click on um, audio of the time as well. Next year for Plutarch, we'll be reading Two Lives. We use the Plutarch Project Revised Edition to read about Philopemen and Titus Flaminius. I know for some people, Plutarch can seem overwhelming. In our lesson plans this year, we're providing some more guidance for teaching Plutarch. We don't want you to miss the subject that Mason so highly esteemed. She stated in her book, School Education, perhaps nothing outside of the Bible has the educational value of Plutarch's lives. Seventh and eighth graders will be continuing in their reading of Charlotte Mason's fifth volume titled Ourselves. 
This book is best read with your students so you can discuss it and chew on the ideas of what it means to be human and how to understand the way God has made us. Let's talk about English. We're continuing on with the Michael Clay Thompson books for grammar and composition. We really like the way he talks about language and the importance of knowing the parts of speech, not just so we can know it, but so that we can apply it to our writing and our communication. This is also a subject that is best done together with your students so you can discuss the ideas and have the students articulate what the author is saying. This year, we're going to be providing copywork and dictation passages that come from the terms books. We will be providing a packet for each student that will have the passages written out. We hope this will be a helpful addition. You can always feel free to find your own passages as well. So seventh graders will be using Paragraph Town and Practice Town, while the eighth graders will be using Grammar Voyage and Practice Voyage. For geography, we are doing something new this year. All across the grades in geography, there are various strands that we want to cover. Physical geography, historical, regional, and cartography are the study of maps. We will be exploring those strands based on the time period we are studying. One of the books that we will be reading next year for seventh and eighth grade is called Death on the River of Doubt. This is a fascinating story about President Theodore Roosevelt after his term. He was an adventurous man, and this book tells of his goal to be part of the first team to go across an unnamed river in the Amazon jungle. This is a great way to incorporate history, geography, culture, and map making. So we have one book for every term that will be based on the historical time period. Another one is called Yosemite, The Nature of Yosemite, A Visual Journey. This is a very beautifully illustrated book that has insightful passages written by different contributors about the places, animals, and flora that they love about this region. This book will help them explore different geographic features and have an appreciation for this beautiful place. I especially like this book because the foreword was written by John Muir Laws, who is a great friend of the Charlotte Mason Institute. We are looking at this one because the National Park Service was established in 1916 to preserve the national parks. So that is a great part of our heritage. Canadian students are free to use these geography books, but we also have separate lessons that come from a book called The Big Book of Canada. Now I will talk about history. The historical period we will be studying for the 23-24 school year is 1900 to present. We will immerse ourselves in this time period as we learn about composers, artists, poets, and authors. U.S. and world history will be the same for 7th, 8th, and 9th grade. Kelly is going to tell you more about this. For 7th and 8th grade, the U United States history, um, we mentioned already the photojournalism and how that impacted the history of the time frames for the 20th century. We're going to be using several of these. Um, we'll kind of reach back a little bit and talk about how, um, how a photographer captured uh, the American Indian dignity and beauty um, in this, this one. And then we move on and we talk about other, other areas of um, important influence that photography had, um, Lewis Hine and the Breaker Boys. Um, and child labor. And then we'll cover more of the history of the, the Dust Bowl when we talk about Migrant Mother as well. Another book that we use for uh, the American history is The Seen and Unseen. This is a graphic novel that tells the story of three different photographers and how they either experienced or captured the American, the Japanese American incarceration at the beginning of World War II and um, the the experience that that um, the mo moving of the people into the camps, as well as the families in the camps, and um, 
what their experiences were afterwards. So this is a really good, a good picture to talk about how pictures make a difference. There are quite a few others that you'll see that we use. This is a series that we're, we're using for US history and even moves into some of the world history um, as we talk about things and the, the impact that different events and pictures have um, to tell the story of, of what's going on in history at the different times. So moving further into world history for seventh and eighth grade, we have a couple of spine books that we have. This is a illustrated um, edition of Peter Frankopin's The Silk Roads. And does a really good job of chapter by chapter, giving a good overview of the time and what's happening, the really important events. It's a little bit younger, but it helps to balance out some of the other things that we're studying. Um, and it, it gives a really good insight into more of what you'll be studying after you read the chapter. Now this book is also used for ancient history. The other main spine, seventh and eighth and ninth uses is this younger young people's version of 1493. It's actually, a, it is not American history, it is world history. It moves from Columbus's voyage to globalization. And so we have a really wide a view of world history using this book. Most of the chapters that we use, use are um, going to cover a larger time frame. So it reaches back into time and it moves forward into time a little further than we normally would go. But it, it covers um, things a little bit more topically, but it captures the, uh, the themes that we're talking about. And for the 20th century, we'll, it will bring in more a bigger picture of especially some areas in Asia that we haven't looked at yet. So since we are talking about World War I, um, this is a really good book that we're using to kind of bring in outlines of World War One, and it talks about um, all the ways that things are, what, what's going on and the ways that we see the pictures, with the, whether it's propaganda for good or, ba or, or bad, um, they're both, it's all in here. And this is how the world has, um, has seen through the pictures, the uh, events of World War One and how, how it progresses forward. World War II, uh, also has a lot of um, photography that's associated with that um, and what's happening um, in Europe during this time frame is covered here um, and it gives us a good outline to follow World War II with. Uh, it's, it's, World War II is really broad and there's, there's a couple of different theaters and different places and this gives us a, a really good way of having an outline to follow events and the important events that are are going on and this one is covering Europe of course. Uh, this one is a really good book um, that helps us deal with the Vietnam War in an age-appropriate way. It really doesn't focus so much on the war as it does on this um, orphan who was part of the, uh, the evacuation that the U.S. helped with um, and it, it's his story about how he escaped from Saigon during the war and um, his experience as an American boy and um, how he goes back and sees, sees those things and looks for what, he, what is familiar and what has changed for him. The last thing that we do is we also include uh, sometimes the historical novels that will help bring to life the situations that we're talking about. Um, we have a couple of different ones. These are just a couple of them um, that deal with World War I. And um, this one actually deals with PTSD and is a good way to introduce that to your student in a, in a way that it shows how families and um, people deal with war in different ways. Um, and, and there's another one um, that we're using for uh, World War II. Um, takes place in Amsterdam. And this one is for the last term. And it is a really... Uh, insightful, uh, a thoughtful book written by Elizabeth Laird, who lived in the Middle East during different times of conflict. And this is the, the fictional story about a boy and his family that, um, that show us how he, uh, he and his family adapt and change and what goes on within the Syrian, uh, Syrian war and civil war 
and how they have to escape and how they become refugees and what happens in the refugee camp and and helps us to see through their eyes and live in their shoes a little bit. Shows us about the culture and the times and the people in, in a way that helps us deal with this in a, in a historical fiction so that we can have um, a lot of ideas that we can discuss with our students as they go. For ancient history, we will cover the year 350 to 800 AD. We will be reading a couple of chapters from the book, The Silk Roads, as well as the biography, Athanasius, Against the World. He was an important church father in the fourth century. We will learn about his life and the context that he lived in and the struggles that he went through to stand up for Christianity. We will also be reading Belisarius. This is a well-researched historical fiction book that takes place during the Byzantine Empire and will give students a glimpse into life back then. There will also be other selected readings that will be provided in the lesson plans. Let's talk about literature. We wanted to have a mix of classic and more modern books. We have a couple of books that take place in our ancient period of history for next year. So we will be reading King Arthur by Andrew Lang. It's shorter than other versions. It can be read in one term. He is a master storyteller. We will also be reading an epic poem by G.K. Chesterton called The Ballad of the White Horse. This is a very accessible poem about Alfred the Great and the pagan Danes in the seventh century England. It is also very interesting to read this epic poem when we are studying World War II. Chesterton wrote it in light of what was happening with Hitler in Germany. So there are multiple layers to it. I really hope the students can relate to this poem. As far as other literature, we will be reading Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which takes place in the 1930s Mississippi and deals with the difficult time it was for African Americans. We also will be reading Wind in the Willows, the classic English children's novel. And even though it may seem to be a novel for younger children, the themes and sophisticated language, I think are better appreciated by older students. So even if you read it to them when your kids were younger, I hope they will give it another chance and look at it with fresh eyes. There's so much to explore in this novel. I'm excited for what we are doing for poetry this year. We really want to encourage students to read poetry daily and then once a week have a more focused time for poetry analysis. The seventh graders will be finishing What is Poetry? The second half of the book is more about writing poetry. And for their daily poetry reading, they'll be reading a fun book called A Kick in the Head, <laughs> as well as poems from more modern poets as well. This book is a fun way to explore different poetic devices and different kinds of poems, such as limericks and couplets and haikus. The eighth graders will be reading a Michael Clay Thompson book that we are introducing this year called A World of Poetry. This is the first time we will be using this book. It's an accessible way to analyze poetry. They will also be reading from an anthology called I Too Sing America, which includes poems from three centuries of African-American poets. It has brief bios and beautiful pictures and just a great way to explore those poems. They will also be studying modern poets such as Frost, Langston Hughes, and Paul Fleshman. Now we're going to talk about science. Danielle is going to tell you all about it. Hi guys, Danielle here to introduce you to some of our new science books this year for Form 3. As you may know, we conducted um, a survey earlier in the season this year to understand better what kind of support you need in science for your Form 3 students. And that's contributed to a number of updates that we're making for this year. Um, we heard that you need that progressive building of knowledge that we have in science, We need that you need that to be a little bit more explicit so that you don't have to do the work of adjusting the more generalized content to the specific level of knowledge and experience for um, each grade. 
And we heard that it can feel like a huge jump. Um, some of our kids come in from form two and grade seven feels like a huge jump. And then again, from grade eight to grade nine feels like a big jump. So you'll see a bit of or reorganization here as we try to smooth that out and make that a more gradual growing process for them. We're also trying to weave in more of your teacher training and you'll see some all new lab, lab books designed specifically for grades seven and eight. Your lore is where I wanna start, however. Lore, these nature stories are meant to be shared, really. We want to love these stories. We wanna create a community and a culture where the kids remember these stories and they wanna continue this habit. That's really where we're headed. Okay, when they transition from form three into high school, this should be a habit. It's no longer a lesson for them. So we're giving you a couple of options and trying to build in some flexibility to help that um, happen easier. So the first story that you see on your program is a book called That Quail Robert. This is a story about um, an egg, a quail egg that was found in the woods by a family. And they brought it home and sat it on their kitchen counter, just thinking that it was um, a beautiful thing to look at. And then the egg hatched and they got to take care of this little quail and raise him and make him part of their family. The second um, nature lore book that you'll see on your program as a choice is called Belle's Journey. Belle is um, an osprey and she was tagged by a scientist in the Northeast. This book was actually written by an osprey scientist. So this is one of his osprey that he tagged. And this is her story. Um, what he learned about her as he tracked her and all the places that she went and, and he gets to share her firsts with us. The third book that is on the program for Lore is called The Hay Meadow by Gary Paulson. The Hay Meadow is about an 11 year old boy who um, goes to his grandfather's sheep farm for a summer to take care of his huge herd of sheep. And it's about all the things that he sees and learns and his how much growing up happened that year because of all of the all the responsibility he had. So whether you have a group of eighth graders and you're in a classroom and you want to start your day with a group reading, or maybe you have a fifth grader and a seventh grader and a 10th grader, and you want to make washing the supper dishes just a little bit more life-giving, you've got some flexibility here to choose a story and just enjoy it together. So make this a place where these stories are part of your culture. Um, as I said, in, in high school, nature lore has to become a habit and it moves to the afternoon. Okay. So we don't want you to think that that means that it's any less important because it's been moved to the afternoon. Um, it should still be happening, but based on the needs and the dynamic of your group, you need to decide how that shift happens. If you have older students um, and lore is already a part of their habit, I wanted to mention to you that it is fine for you guys. Just feel free to choose something off the high school list too. There might be something like the mind of a raven or something that they want to share with your high schoolers. And that's fine too. Another element of um, a Mason science program is general science. So let's talk about your general science and what you'll see there this year. Um, we saw that you really, really needed form three to be more connected to form four. And so your schedule provides a more gradual transition this year. They're going from three days a week um, with their general science in grade seven, and that includes their lab day, to four days a week in grade eight, so that when they move to five days a week in grade nine, it won't feel like such a huge change. Um, it won't feel so overwhelming. So what that has allowed us to do is to give the form three students the complete entire um, series from the story of science. So they're gonna be able to read the whole story, all three volumes across form three. They'll get all of that historical, social, political context that's in that story um, and really understand that perspective of science as a developing area of knowledge that is intimately, intimately intertwined with the human experience. Um, the schedule also allows us to do more in their lab books, and those lab books are completely new. They are comprehensive um, and progressive in the way that they present um, the concepts 
and the knowledge building that is going on in Form 3. They include all of the instruction and the materials lists and guidance um, that your students need. And it, it will um, those lab books introduce them to and give them some practice with many of the topics that they're going to see in level one in high school. So that it won't be quite such a shock to them um, when they go ahead and start high school and all of a sudden there's all this new stuff. It won't feel quite so new anymore. Um, I know that these books can be a challenge. Y'all have told me that. And I, I think that's great though. I think that this is a good challenge because the author is asking the student to consider different viewpoints that produce all of that complexity in the human story. It gives the students a wholeness in their thinking so that when they start high school science and prepare to go out into the world, they have a big picture view of where all of these different ideas and disagreements and the way that thinking happens, where that's coming from. Great opportunities for the grand conversation here in Form 3. The third component um, to your Mason Science program is natural history. So we don't want to forget to talk about that. The seventh graders are going to be focusing on the girl who drew butterflies. The girl who drew butterflies is um, the story of Maria Marion. Um, she was trained in the 1800s as um, a flower um, artist, but her real passion was insects. And so she brought this, brought this together, her passion for insects and her work as an artist. Um, and the whole field of ecology really was born um, from her work. So the kids now in seventh grade get this wonderful building, this, this um, blossoming um, of the idea of ecosystem. And aha, this is where this whole field of science actually came from. Um, and they also get to build on the botany and the uh, microscopy that they did in Form 2 with this book as well and do some of that work here. The eighth graders are going to be using this book by Jim Murphy um, called Invincible Microbe, and they'll be focusing here. And in this one, too, they get some historical context for the field of microbiology. This one is about tuberculosis. Um and the history there. And they also get some really important social context for infectious disease and how we as a society um, deal with that and cope with that. Um, Jim Murphy is such a master at weaving the, the facts together into the human story. And so both of these books, again, provide really great opportunities for the grand conversation. And Form 3 is just such an important time for that conversation to be happening. So I'm really excited for our Form 3 students, and I'm looking forward to seeing how all of these, um, these books and these revisions in the program support their blossoming relationship with science as they begin to transition into high school.